This is a story about me and this mountain. The mountain I'm referring to is one of the great ones, Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. I'm David Hoffman, filmmaker, and I'm going to enjoy telling you the story of me and that mountain. So I'm a guy in my early 40s, and I take these incredible trips with a company called Butterfield and Robinson. They plan these very fancy elite travel trips called adventure travel. It was new then. You signed up and you went someplace amazing and they took care of everything. They took care of the food, they took care of the wow walks, they took care of the special places you could go. And I'm really excited. I've taken several trips before with them. I've gone to the north of Greece, near the Albanian border, to the town of Iyanana, and walked in the mountains that were right on the edge of Albania. Incredible. I've been in Provence with them, walking in the beautiful fields and the perfect French towns. I've been in the caves region of France, where you could see the caves that nobody else saw with Butterfield and Robinson. I loved walking, contemplative, thoughtful, historical, and being a kind of a filmmaker historian, wish I had filmed this, I really wanted to get into the history of it. And so, I'm going to Africa to climb Kilimanjaro. So exciting. I bring along a friend who knows about the food and the wine. She had been with me on other trips so that she could order the special food you get. She would know which wine to get. That's what I think is happening. And I exercise, really exercise, get my body in shape, get the right boots, take quinine for malaria, because you could get it in Africa, and I'm ready to go. Family sees me off at the airport, get on the plane, and some lady sitting next to me says, you know, quinine doesn't work. People have been dying in Tanzania from a new kind of malaria. Ooh, boy. I don't like hearing that. I'm a hypochondriac. I've told you that before, but I really am. I'm terrified. I get off in Dar es Salaam. Mosquitoes all over the airport. I just want one of those orange sodas that they sell everywhere in the world. And there's got a few of them, but there's mosquitoes. I'm scared, but I'm on my way. Get to Moshi, a little town right at the base of the mountain. And I meet my other 13 colleagues, the other 13 climbers. And the guide from Butterfield and Robinson, who's going to take us up the mountain. 19,000 feet tall, snow at the top. You can see it. This is really exciting. I'm prepared, I got my boots, got my quinine, got my health, got an ally who could take care of me, ready to go. First night we meet the other 13. They're in about the same physical shape I am in, but there are a couple of big athletes and these two women, heavy smokers, I say to myself, they ain't never gonna make it to the top. The guide sits us down and instead of giving the normal, this is gonna be exciting, he warns us about altitude sickness, about how it can kill you, about how you have to get down the mountain real fast if you get it. So now my story begins. It's the morning of the climb. These local guys carry your bag up the mountain, 255 pounds per person. They carry, so all you have is a day pack and your camera if you want, you're taking pictures, and you on your first day of the walk. It's about seven or eight days up to the top and then down again. And it's hard at the top, no oxygen. They sing this song, which I asked somebody, what's this mean? Well, it's kind of a welcoming song, but it's also hoping to God we don't die up there. <laughs> oh boy. And I take off walking. My guide's up in front of me, my colleague is by me, and people are walking at their own paces and I'm just on the path, starting at about 3,500 feet. I get to 6,500 feet. I don't feel so good. In fact, I feel weak. I'm not supposed to feel weak, it's way below where the oxygen is too low. I call to the guide, sir, I don't feel good. And it's fevery. And he says, really? Get down now. Don't stay on this walk. Get off the walk. He runs down with me. I run back with my colleague. It's downhill. It's easy, but I am getting really sick. I get to where we started. There's a cab there. He calls the cab over. Take this man to the clinic. Throws the bag in my cab. By the time I get to the clinic, about 20 minutes away, I am really sick. I can hardly walk. I'm like really weak. I get out and there's a line of about 70 people, local Tanzanians, local Moshi people, 
uh, waiting to go to the clinic. They look at me, and I look at them, and they all step to the side. I'm not kidding. And they allow me to crawl up to the door. It was beautiful. It was an act of kind generosity to this white guy who clearly didn't know what he was doing. And I was really sick. I get to the door. I'm crawling. I knock on the door. And the doctor opens the door, looks down at me, says, Sir, you shouldn't be here. You should be in the hospital. I crawl back to the cab. Take me to Moshi Hospital. I get to Moshi Hospital. It is a hospital, but when you enter it, you're told right away, we have no beds here. Then the guy looks at me at the front desk and he says, well, we do have one bed. And they send me to this room and I crawl into the bed. And next to me, there's another bed with a guy named Emmanuel. Now I'm going to tell you about Emmanuel in a minute. But I'm in the bed and I am feverish. I'm bad. A nurse comes in, she puts the thermometer in my mouth. Don't know if it was washed in advance, but it was just before AIDS became known. AIDS was in Tanzania, but nobody knew what it was at that point. 104.5, holy shit, I'm scared. I look to Emmanuel, hello Emmanuel, Emmanuel says, hello David, and uh, what's your problem? I said, I don't know, I think maybe I got malaria. He said, oh, I have malaria, I've been here for two months. You'll, you'll recover. If you don't die, it'll be okay. Doctor comes in, a Nigerian doctor trained in London, now living in Tanzania. Gives me a shot with a needle, big, huge needle, this big, the needle point this big, and it says made in China. I'll never forget that. And gives me the shot, says this is anti-malarial something or other. We think you might have malaria. And as he's leaving, I say to him, Am I going to live? And he says words I'll never forget. We hope so. Now, no American doctor would say that. They say, well, of course you're going to live. We're going to take care of you. But here is what well, we hope so. My friend follows the needle out all the way down to where it's being sterilized and sees, in fact, the needle is being boiled and then reused. We didn't know about AIDS, as I said. So I get this shot, and I'm lying in bed, and I begin to talk with Emmanuel. He's from a town about 300 kilometers away, where he's the chief. And below his bed, he has like 15 different Merck manuals and other medical books. And people are coming in, in the hospital, patients, and asking him questions. And he's looking them up and telling them what to do, what not to do. So I'm seeing people from the hospital. And I get the chance to interact. Many of them speak English, and I can see Maasai. I can see people who have no arms and no legs, have surgery being conducted. I saw people from the cancer ward. I was very nice to everybody, and Emmanuel was a clear leader, powerful guy. The next morning, first thing, I'm sick as a dog. Nobody knows what's happening to me. I'm lying in the bed. And a woman comes in, and she starts talking her language. And Emmanuel's saying, and she's talking, I said, Emmanuel, what's going on? He says, well, she's from my village, and people carry my messages every day, one to the other, until somebody walks in and tells me what's going on that I have to be involved with. Unbelievable system. And he's advising them. And maybe midday, a Maasai man comes with a full outfit and his stick, and he stands at the door, and he looks at me, and he nods. And I ask Emmanuel, why is he here? And he said, David, we decided you're a good white man, and he's come to protect you from the cancer ward. He's dying. Protect me from evil spirits or anything else. I nod to him. He nods to me. And every day he came in the morning, and he stayed until the evening, just standing there. It was absolutely beautiful, beautiful people. I then, on day three, a local young lab guy comes in. Mr. Hoffman, would you tell me about the United States? We all know about the United States. And I started to tell him what it was like to live in America, what it was like to live in my town in Maine. Next day there were two people. Then there were three people. Just want to hear about America. In return, they take care of me. I get a little bit of special food. At one point I had a severe headache and I asked for aspirin. They didn't have any aspirin. They didn't have anything, really. It was really intense. 
it was beautiful. These people, all of whom in this really rough condition, interacting with me and feeling kind, human to one another. On day four, a woman dies in the hospital. It's gossip all around the hospital. She's from Maine. She's a white filmmaker. And she got altitude sickness and died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Holy shit. I'm stuck in this place. I don't know what to do. I've got to live. I'm not dying, but I don't know if I'm going to get over it or not. It's really scary. By the way, every day I could look through the window right past Emmanuel and I could see the mountain. And I knew my colleagues were climbing the mountain. I assumed some of them would make it to the top. Although the guide had told us, not all of you are going to make it. It was just amazingly intense. I'm beginning to get better. And on day seven, a young and beautiful woman, maybe 18 years old, full African jewelry, and comes in to give Emmanuel the morning news and messages. She just, she looks like a model, an international model. When she leaves, I say, Emmanuel, that is the most beautiful woman I've seen to date. He says, David, she's ugly, skinny. Really? I said, well, he said, let me show you my wife. And he shows a picture of a big, healthy, round, robust woman. He says, that's my taste. You guys don't have any taste at all. I loved it. On the last night, a whole bunch of people come over to me. They know I'm leaving the next day. I'm weak, but I'm alive. They sing a song. They wish me well. I get up in the morning. I leave the hospital. And I have to stay in Moshi for a day to see that I'm going to be OK. And it just so happens that for lunch, I take the doctor and his wife to lunch. I want to thank him. He helped me live. And the doctor's wife is also a big, robust woman. Very interesting. At night, my colleagues are returning from the walk. 13 of them, well, 12, minus me. And we're all sitting around the table, and they're all curious, concerned about me, and curious, what happened to you, David? I tell my story. They're listening. First of all, who made it to the top? The two women who smoked cigarettes. The big muscle guys didn't. The guy did. And the two women who smoked cigarettes talked all the way up, including no oxygen, freezing, you know, wearing snow gear. Unbelievable. Anyway, I tell my story, and they're listening, like, intensely. And at the end, they say, I think you had a better time than we did. I think you got more out of the trip than we ever did. We never really even saw the people of Tanzania. And you know what? I did. Now, those of you who have watched my other videos know I believe in making something good out of something bad. At this time, I didn't know it like I know it today. I didn't realize until after just how spectacular this negative experience, this chance that I was going to die, this total reversal of my vacation plans turned into one of the most memorable things in my life. When I returned to the United States, I wrote the lab guide. And I said, is there anything I can do for you people? And he said, we don't have an EKG machine. So I bought one and I sent it to him. I'm not saying that because I'm Mr. Terrific. I'm saying that because they were Mr. Terrific. Because their sense of humanity showed me that there's safety in the world because there are people of goodwill everywhere. So that's my story, Kilimanjaro the mountain, David Hoffman, the filmmaker climber, Unfortunately, I didn't film that. Saying to you that if a situation arises in your life where it could go either way, take the road of this is amazing and my pretty well confident guess is it will be. Thank you.